I offer these every week along with a guided meditation. Just click the uh, subscribe link below to be notified through YouTube when I post the latest recording. Or if you'd like to join us live, which would be great, uh, just go into the description section below and follow the link along to be able to sign up for free. I would like to uh, respond briefly to two questions that came in the chat uh, before we began to meditate. The first question, which was asked in different ways by a couple of people, pardon me, uh, is how can we draw on the benefits of being aware of the body if, for us, the body has become scary or it be, it's scary to be in touch with the body, particularly if there's a history of trauma or maybe the body has been involved in an eating disorder. So awareness of the body can be tricky. Uh, really important point. The broad principle here is pragmatic. Do what works for you. And um, if some kind of traditional instruction that's maybe a little dogmatic is just not working for you, I encourage you to find other ways, uh, perhaps even other teachers that are helpful for you, uh, if it's just not working for you. There's all kinds of diversity, including diversity of life history, temperament, impact, um, and just ways of being all together. So do what works for you. Second. Uh, there is a, a benefit in some object of attention that's stable. So if it doesn't work for you to be aware of the body, maybe there's something else that would have the benefit as well of being reassuring and steadying. Because uh, if it's scary to be aware of the body, well, anxiety is in play. So looking for resource experiences that are antidotes to anxiety or resources or resources for it could be helpful. Like, as I'm doing right now, looking at the wall in my room, which at least in this moment is still standing. Um, still here, still here. And as a scared little animal, it's comforting to know that some of the boundaries of my burrow, <laughs> my tan, <laughs> my little shelter are stable. That's a good thing. Okay, pay attention to the wall. Uh, or perhaps be aware of other parts of the body that are less charged than maybe breathing is, understandably, such as your feet or your hands. Or <clears throat> if it's helpful to you, there is a place for a kind of muscular commitment to staying in touch with what you know is true, even if 99% of you is yelling at you that it's not. But if that 1% of you knows that in the present you're still breathing, that you're still going on being, your heart is beating, you're still here, you're not dissolving, you're not fragmenting, you're still here, not in horrible pain, maybe even with a general sense of kind of global well being in your body, who? If 1% of you knows that, hold on to that and be fiercely committed to it. You can do that. That's a practice. It might, can be challenging to do, uh, especially in the beginning. You might lose it again and again, but you can keep coming back. You know, just briefly here, I've taught hundreds of people to rock climb in personal growth workshop settings, including rappelling, where if you know how to do it, you are in a harness that's connected to the rope that's anchored at the top, and then you slide down the rope under control uh, into basically space. And it's completely scary in the beginning. It's tech counterintuitive for the monkey inside us all. So I've had many experiences of being sitting there at the edge with the person who's going over the edge uh, and saying to them, essentially, look at me. <laughs> You know, stay with me here. Stay with that 1% of you that trusts me, even though 99% of you thinks I'm crazy. Stay with that 1%. You know, stay on the beam here as you slowly back over the edge of the cliff. So what's that 1% knowing of what's true for you that can be your refuge? And hold fast. Hold fast. You know, I think about people whose hands are tattooed sometimes, you know, on one hand, H-O-L-D, on the other hand, F-A-S-T hold fast. There's a place for that. Okay. 
Next question. Um, <clears throat> what to do when certain terms or words just don't do it for you? Here again, the principle is pragmatic. So if I say, if I point out by whatever words we use, there is a process of recognizing what's true. I shorthanded that as discernment. There is also a process of valuing or, or having standards or having a moral awareness, right? There's a place for having standards. And then third, there's a place for connecting those two and uh, seeing potentially how close reality is coming to the standard or not. And I called that judging. Now, judging has gotten a bad word, bad, a bad rap in some quarters. And if that term is not working for you, no problem. Because it, it has bad, it has problematic connotations for many people, and if it if it does have problematic connotations for a person, it's helpful to, <clears throat> in a key phrase here, start by joining, as best you can, if you can, in your initial response to that person, appreciating how and why that term might be problematic for them, and then if you like, differentiating if it's appropriate to just report what's true for you, not to try to convince the other, but just as information, what's true for you, perhaps, is that word is not charged. It's not, does not have problematic connotations. But it's skillful to do this after starting by joining. And that's something I've tried to remember many times and I keep forgetting, start by joining. Okay, uh, so what do you do? Um, you might prefer to have different terminology, and I was thinking about, you know, like the game kids play with the, I forget the name, they're blindfolded, they close their eyes, they're trying to, you know, find something, and other people will be saying, warmer, warmer, colder, colder, <laughs> you know, <laughs> red hot, ice cold, as they approach, right, the goal, the standard. You might use different words besides judging for that. But there's no, there's no escape from the need for, however we call it, you know, discovering reality and recognizing what you've discovered, knowing that your discovery might be refined over time. Second, knowing what you care about, knowing what you value, knowing what's important to you. And um, then third, discerning the closeness or gaps between reality and your values, and then moving into a plan about it. Uh, but find other words. It's really okay. And that's just true in general. Okay. So now I'd like to launch into my prepared remarks. Let's see, prepared remarks here, and um, uh, see what uh, is useful for you and what I have to say. And uh, I'll pay attention to what's coming through the chat. And also, uh, yes, pin the tail on the donkey, by the way. Cold, warmer, warmer, red hot. There you go. Um, and uh, see what's useful for you and what I'm about to say. Okay. So these days, uh, unless you're resolutely living in a cave, literally or figuratively, it's hard not to be aware of a lot of scary things. Right now, and a heat dome is sitting over the West, and the frequency and intensity of adverse weather events inevitably uh, increases as the planet heats up, which it does inevitably as humans produce greenhouse gases that trap heat over the course of centuries now. Um, the average temperature in the planet Earth right now is about three degrees Fahrenheit hotter than it was 250 years ago at the start of the Industrial Revolution, and it's inevitably going to get hotter still um, until we start pulling carbon out of the sky, and especially until we stop dumping ever more greenhouse gases into the sky. Um, about 55 billion metric tons of CO2 equivalents every year currently. So <clears throat> these things are happening. Uh, in America, my country, uh, our, you know, we have a major, uh, many major elections coming this November, a lot of activity around it, um, looking out at the other countries in the world, uh, right-wing movements are on the rise, authoritarianism is on the rise, militarism is on the rise, AI and other technologies with vast and disturbing implications are on the rise. 
Uh, sorry to freak you out, but if you're not already freaked out, uh, you're probably not paying close attention. So how do we manage this? How do we bring the wisdom of the Dharma, the ideas and methods uh, laid out by the Buddha and then developed and evolving over 2,500 years or so since, how do we bring the wisdom of the Dharma to the anxiety, the anger, the outrage, the helplessness, the preoccupations, the despair that understandably, you know, we're dealing with these days, including just not knowing what to do. That's what I'd like to explore with you tonight. Um, <clears throat> there's a story that uh, I heard uh, just the other night in a group I was in that had to do in the Tibetan Buddhist tradition of uh, Kuan Yin or Tara or I struggle to pronounce it correctly, Avaloshchivara, these embodiments in a cosmic sense, in a supernatural sense, these embodiments of compassion. Uh, and as the story is told, Tara, I'll use that word, uh, Tara was aware of the vast suffering of countless beings and countless realms and made a choice, made a choice in the face of all that suffering not to despair, which created an opening, a, a space in which the bodhisattva aspiration and movement could occur, could breathe and have life, to care for and relieve the suffering of all beings. Despair takes us into helplessness and freezing as a response to stressors and trauma, uh, giving up. And Tara, as the embodiment of compassion, chose not to despair as a choice in the face of all that is. And it is a choice not to despair. We can make that choice. Now that choice does not um, bypass clear discernment and clear valuing, uh, which is to say being appalled by so many of the unnecessary causes of vast systems of suffering in our world today. Not despairing does not mean putting on rose-colored glasses or uh, just, you know, believing like uh, the philosopher Pangloss and Candide, this is the best of all possible worlds. It sure is not yet. Not despairing is not about, you know, blind optimism. We still see clearly. But not despairing includes not knowing what the future holds exactly and doing the best we can meanwhile. I think about Nikosi Johnson, whose story you may know is a young boy in South Africa whose mother uh, was HIV positive. He was born with HIV, developed AIDS. And by the time he was still quite young, you know, maybe 12 or 13 or so, he eventually died from the disease, which at that point in the, I believe, 1980s or so, uh, there was not the level of medicine that there is now for it today. So here's this child stuck with an incurable fatal illness at a very young age. And yet he became a strong advocate in his country for people with HIV in the face of a lot of prejudice and superstition and resistance at that time, at that place. And he became known as a, as a courageous advocate. And he said at one point uh, some words that I paraphrase very slightly as, he said, do all that you can with what you've been given in the place where you are in the time that you have. That little boy chose not to despair. And if he 
with the deck that he was dealt, playing it as best he could in his life, his short life, chose not to despair. Whew. How can I, how can we succumb to despair and just give up? So what does it mean in practical terms not to despair? And what are some things that can help us as we face the conditions of our life, which I began with you know, large-scale um, economic, cultural, um, climatological, political conditions? What can we do with um, an intractable illness? Or what can we do with um, harms that we've done in our life to others that we cannot undo? What can we do with um, tendencies that we may have ourselves, right? What, what does it mean not to despair? In a larger context in, in which uh, we're appreciating the value of compassion, which is moved by suffering and wants to relieve it, including by changing its underlying causes for the better. Well, I think one thing that helps us not to despair, particularly with regard to the world, is to appreciate how much progress humanity has actually made, particularly in the last several hundred years. We have a long way to go, but recognizing progress does not mean we quit and we stop, but it does mean that we take heart we um, find antidotes to despair and hopelessness in recognizing the very positive developments that have occurred in the world in the last several hundred years. The developments of science, of medicine, uh, you know, real democracies which did not exist on this planet until you know, several hundred, 250 or so years ago. Uh, Many people in the world, roughly a fifth of the world's population, live in a relatively well-functioning democracy, even if it's far from perfect, including in my own country. Um, the movement of women over the last especially 50 years or so, maybe 100 years, again, long way to go, uh, but still historically completely unprecedented. Um, growing interconnectedness, growing uh, you know, access to information, growing access to psychological tools, spiritual tools uh, that can be helpful to people. These are very positive developments. Um, I had an odd experience about 10 years ago. I, I was invited to give a 20 minute talk at uh, the World Happiness Forum in Dubai. I'd never been to a, a Middle Eastern country, certainly not a, a Gulf country, Persian Gulf country. And Dubai is a very peculiar place and lots to be said, full of contradictions. But one thing that really struck me in that conference, in which I was a very small frog in a big pond with a lot of big frogs, was how many big frogs there were <laughs> that were working day and night to make the world better. Countless nonprofits I'd never heard of. Uh, government agencies, including in, you know, less than functioning democracy countries that at least in their corner of the pond were doing the best they could. Vast. And I was just seeing the tip of the iceberg, the roughly 10,000 or so uh, people and who were there over the full week uh, were just the tip of the iceberg of hundreds of thousands, maybe tens of millions of good-hearted people and good-hearted organizations that were doing the best they could. So we have both the history of success and progress in many, many quarters. Let's not lose sight of that. And let's not lose sight of the many, many people who are working uh, with a good heart to make the world better each day. As uh, fam Mr. Rogers, the TV person and for me an American saint, uh, who uh, was known to many, as he reported his own mother said to him when he was young, Frank, or Frankie, I don't know, uh, when you're upset or scared, look for the helpers. Look for the helpers. It's a major antidote to despair, to appreciate the ways in which we benefit from the sincere efforts of so many people in generations past, and we also benefit from and can take heart in so many good people
today, including you all, me, in our own ways, trying to make the world a better place, trying to keep mending and stitching and adding uh, threads to the fabric of healthy um, countries and societies. It also helps us uh, to take the actions that we can, as Nkosi Johnson put it. Take the actions you can. I think there's a Jewish proverb, it's better to light a single candle than to curse the darkness. So one of the ways that I'm taking action that I'll just tell you about right now in uh, this time is that if you think about it, one of the best ways to support uh, pro-social activity in a uh, reasonably functioning democracy or in countries in general is to increase what's called civic engagement. Civic engagement is the participation of individuals in the ways that they can uh, to help the world be better. Uh, civic engagement looks different in Finland than it does in, um, let's say, Saudi Arabia or Iran or um, Hong Kong. And still, civic engagement is um, a really important thing to do. It's important to realize that civic engagement is nonpartisan. We're not taking sides with civic engagement. And in a country like America, in which voter turnout is really the key to preserving democracy this November, and it's really the key broadly in electing pro-social candidates who enact pro-social policies and laws, one of the best ways that we can connect individual well-being and societal well-being is to promote civic engagement and promote and encourage people to register to vote, get informed, and actually vote. To encourage people to claim the power they do have, which will make them feel better, to experience the agency they do have, and to uh, you know, vote for the sake of others if you don't vote for yourself. And this can make a real difference. Voter turnout can make an actual difference in close elections. So you might like to take a look to the website I dropped into the, um, um, where am I here, uh, into the chat and um, take a look at that. That's an initiative that I've gotten involved with. That's one action I'm doing. Um, I invite you to you know, join the network to heal democracy if you're so moved. And more broadly, you know, we can all have different opinions about uh, the different actions that are useful to make a better world. Whatever you consider them to be, if you take action, that's you know, a great antidote to anxiety and a great comfort. And bit by bit, drop by drop, much as countless raindrops gradually carved the Grand Canyon, drop by drop, bit by bit, you know, we can gradually, um, what's the phrase, tikkun alam, you know, we can keep mending the fabric, the tattered fabric um, of our collectiveness in our communities, okay, tikkun alam. Now, in particular, um, I would like to speak to uh, something that's been really powerful and useful for me lately in the cultivation of what in Buddhist frameworks is called bodhicitta. So here I would like to share with you a book that my friend Scott Snibby, S-N-I-B-B-E, -E, and maybe somebody could put Scott's name in the chat, Scott Snibby, who has a wonderful new book out. Uh, Scott's a deep teacher and practitioner, uh, and he shared with me this book, whose cover is a teaching. I highly recommend the book. I find the cover to be so powerful that I actually sometimes put the book face down because I have such respect for what it feels like to look at this being, Ryber Rinpoche, 
um, that I want to treat it with full respect. In the chat, I put the title of the book, um, which I believe, yes, How to Generate Bodhicitta by Ryber Rinpoche. Uh, this is in a somewhat Tibetan Buddhist context. Um, you don't have to believe in Tibetan Buddhism to find value and pragmatically for you in, in these teachings. So I'd like to explore with you a little bit uh, the cultivation of what's called bodhicitta, including bodhicitta as an antidote to despair and as a refuge and as a fuel for us as we um, are lived by these qualities inside ourselves that we can cultivate of bodhicitta uh, that uh, feed and fuel us as they flow through us and can help energize us for the marathon, you know, the long, the long game of doing what we can to help make a better world. So bodhicitta. Uh, some people, perhaps some of us here, are uh, quite um, in, engaged in uh, Tibetan Buddhist practice and will know more about traditional approaches to bodhicitta than I do. I welcome your input. Uh, by the way, it's Scott Snibby, S-N-I-B-B-E. Um, I think he has a podcast called something about the skeptical path of enlightenment, something like that. Anyway, bodhicitta. So what, is that, what does that word mean? Well, let's do it in two parts. Chitta means essentially heart, heart mind, or consciousness. Who you are, most broadly and deeply. Chitta. Chitta, or yeah, the, the kind of like the, the fabric of consciousness. And Bodhi, original rooted meaning, basis for the word Buddha, is about seeing clearly. Here we have discernment again, right? Recognizing what's really true, particularly in ways that are liberating, that are penetrating. And so with a mind or a consciousness that continuously sees clearly in liberating ways, naturally what arises is love, caring, lovingness, benevolence, uh, a tender generosity move to relieve suffering and help all beings without number gradually themselves reach the highest happiness of awakening. That's bodhicitta. So as so many things, it's understood in an aspirational frame as a practice, as a cultivation over time as also a gradual uncovering of that which resides down there, deep inside, in the deepest roots of your own being. So we're both, in effect, cultivating bodhicitta and uncovering it. So what are four useful ways to do this? The first is heart-centered practices in general. And if when you formally meditate, and also if in your daily practices of recollection and remembrance and return to your true home, if you do, if you do not bring in the heart, something important is really missing. Don't leave out the heart. So practices formally or informally, of resting in God's love, dare I say that, if that's meaningful for someone, and it's not for many, but if it is meaningful for you, that's a hard practice. Um, finding compassion, initially for those with whom that's easy, or for whom that's easy, and then gradually extending that circle out, building that muscle of compassion, that's a hard practice. Uh, just coming home to self-compassion, Tenderness for yourself, that's a heart practice. You know, including heart practices, uh, both formally and informally in the flow of everyday life. That's a, a primary way, a fundamental way to cultivate this quality of generosity of the heart that innately 
um, eradicates despair. Despair and bodhicitta really have a difficult time coexisting. They might both be rattling around in different corners of your consciousness, but if you rest increasingly in this cultivation of lovingness and wakefulness, uh, there's little or no room for despair. Second, um, as a traditional practice, it is said we should recognize all beings as our beloved mother in a former life. Now, a knowingly mathematical person that I am, I have some trouble with the math of that in terms of planet Earth. You think about how many beings are alive today and uh, how many beings have been alive through history over 300,000 years of human species, blah, blah. But if you expand it to think about the universe altogether, if it's meaningful to you, you can you know, expand the frame here to consider you know, your neighbor, your friend, your child, uh, your partner, the annoying person on political TV as having been your mother in another life. If that works for you, great. Or uh, kind of maybe in simpler, more secular terms, you might consider another person as um, having been important to you. That's easier to do with people you already know, getting in touch with how they have been important to you or could be important to you. And even with people you don't know, like neutral people you pass in the street, uh, like you know how they might be important or what it would feel like for them to be important to you, for them to have been really giving to you. And in that way, as an exploration, as a method that may not work for you, but traditionally is highly recommended as a way of evoking a heartfelt commitment to their welfare. Bodhicitta involves a kind of commitment or a movement, a, you know, a surge of caringness toward another being you know, and beings in general. Okay, so far? Now, obviously, if you're someone who has tended to be overcaring and used up and exploited by others, you have to be careful with this. The point of this is twofold. The cultivation of bodhicitta is a profound, profound engine of awakening. Wow. For your own sake. And it's also, of course, a beautiful service to other beings. So doing it for your own sake and perhaps also for the sake of others might be a way in here. If you've, um, you know, been kind of used up and exploited by others who exploited your good heart. Uh, I find for me, there's a place here for saying essentially, yeah, those other people exploited me and abused me, but I'm not going to let them poison the wholesome, deep wellsprings of beautiful ways of being just because they misused them or tainted them with their own neurosis or mistreatment of me? No, I'm going to reclaim, reclaim what's good and useful. So that's the second factor of bodhicitta. Just letting yourself feel, wow, like I could do it with each of you that I'm seeing in the screen here. You know, you could do it with me. You could do it with other people you see on Zoom. Just take a moment and go, huh. Even if I don't know you, like, wow, what would it be like to really recognize how you have helped me along the way, been good to me, or you could be good to me? What would that be like? Okay. Third, um, this one was wild for me to encounter in Riber Rinpoche's book. What is it like to look at someone and imagine that you are personally responsible? for their complete awakening. Ooh. Now again, this is not about being codependent or being burdened. It's about exploring radical practices. Tibetan Buddhism has a lot of radical practices. What's that like? I actually like it, you know? Now, this then takes me to, um, you know, my next suggestion, the fourth suggestion and last suggestion here which is to really implement 
that sense of responsibility for the awakening and the healing along the way of another person, realistically, to go back to Nikosi Johnson, it means resting in the intention, which is boundless, the bodhisattva aspiration being boundless. The intention is without limit. But the circumstances and the moments we're in are inherently limited. We only have so much time with so much people. With only so much we can offer in the moment. Um, so the implementation in my fourth suggestion is to explore what is it like for a conversation or a task what is it like to feel like you are there for the sake of others? Again, for the pragmatic purpose of releasing the self-contraction that gets in the way of the highest levels of happiness and gets in the way of tapping into the deepest roots in your own being, the self-contraction. One way to release the self-contraction is to explore what it feels like to be living in service to others, to be there for the sake of others, at least for that conversation or that email or that interaction. You're there for their sake. And in that context, you're trying to be truly as helpful as you can. That's doable. That's doable. I'm here sincerely for you. Uh, if I let you abuse me, I can't be here sincerely for you, so I'm not going to let you abuse me. But I'm here sincerely for you. And in that context, I move to be as helpful as I realistically can. That's the fourth cultivation of bodhicitta. There are others in Reba Rinpoche's Bless His Memory, No Longer Alive, a beautiful book. I really encourage you to, to check it out and to explore what it might be like for you quite sincerely to... Uh, engage this cultivation, which has um, been added. I've been, so, I'm a, I've been around the block, and I am really turning toward and adding this particular practice um, uh, for myself and getting a lot from it already. Uh, some of you undoubtedly are farther along in the practice of the cultivation and expression of bodhicitta and, uh, than I am. I respect that. And for myself and for the rest of us, huh, Let's consider taking on this practice, including for the ways in which it is an immediate antidote to despair. Okay. So let me take a peek at the questions, comments that have come in on the chat. I appreciate you all steering away from political controversies and staying focused on your own particular experience, your own particular practice. Um, I'm taking a look here at what people have said. I think uh, I've replied to most to the questions. Uh, yep, so far. Let me see here. Great, great. Okay, I'm looking for questions. Yes, Mother Teresa did not despair. Um, great, great. Uh, the 20 minute talk I gave in Dubai was my usual shtick about positive neuroplasticity and growing the good uh, that lasts inside, taking in the good to grow the good that lasts, including working backwards from particular strengths inside, such as now bodhicitta. We grow the trait of bodhicitta, um, progressing over time and uncovering over time through having experiences of that quality and its different factors that repeatedly become internalized to develop that trait gradually, physically, grounded in our own body. That's the process. Okay, great. Um, Good, bodhicitta. Uh, 
Ah, beautiful quote from John Wesley. Hello, Lillian. Uh, beautiful comment about um, bodhicitta. Alas, Lynn, I think in the limited time I have, I won't be able to respond to you here. You know, good to see you again. It was nice to chat with you the last time. Yeah. Um, let's see. Uh, I'm not putting together Saudi Arabia and democracy. I am saying that forms of civil society can be nurtured and supported even in the context of autocratic regimes to the extent that that's possible. And I respect immensely the people, you know, the newspaper editors, uh, the people forming, you know, worker organizations, parent organizations, you know, building up hospitals, educators, you know, there are many, many ways to uh, enact civic engagement, not just through getting out the vote. So I'm, I'm clear Saudi Arabia is not a democracy. I'm just talking about broad forms of civic engagement and trying to be relatively inclusive. I think it may well be that in certain places, I don't know, maybe North Korea, maybe some other places, it's just not possible. But I appreciate the ways in which even in places that are very traditional, uh, there are still opportunities to gradually weave the threads of civil society. And, and I really honor and respect people who do that, including in very difficult conditions. Okay, so the organization I referred to was healdemocracy.org. That's my personal initiative. It's a clever way to mobilize a broad swath of people in the broad wellness space in America, including self-help, mindfulness training, holistic health, and all the rest, who have to be nonpartisan, but can still connect individual wellness with collective wellness by encouraging civic engagement, by people registering, getting informed, and voting. Uh, and so you can check that out if you like. Okay, so I want to keep moving here around Bodhicitta, Ryber Rinpoche. Excellent. Beautiful. Uh, Tony's point about universal compassion. Good. Very good. Okay. Beautiful. Well, we're moving to an end here. The fact that there's been very little disputing of what I'm saying. Worries me, but also reassures me. <laughs> Great. Good. Ah, bodhicitta and early Buddhism. I'll just make a little comment on that, Joyce. Uh, I looked up at the Access to Insight website, which is an incredible resource for original Buddhism early Buddhism, uh, particularly as codified in what's called the Pali Canon, Canon Collection of Teachings, Pali, a, a language, a key language of early Buddhism. And it's interesting that as I hit the search bar in access to insight, the phrase or the term bodhicitta, I'm not sure it can be found in the entire Pali Canon. So this is a notion that emerged in the movement of Buddhism geographically and temporally uh, outside of uh, you know, northern India 2,500 or so years ago through in more and more the Mahayana movement in which bodhicitta became associated with the bodhisattva aspiration uh, of being in service to all beings and foregoing one's own ultimate release from the wheel of rebirth until everyone else can come along. And that's the frame of a very beautiful aspiration. So bodhicitta is located in that larger context. Um, okay. Uh, so very, very good. Betty, this is incredibly important. I'll finish on this one. 718, Betty asks, um, does this practice apply to people that have caused harm to you? And I see some very, very nice comments from Jamie and and Tony about this. Um, and I also will list the four practices um, as I finish here tonight. Um, we start by cultivating things that are in reach. Okay, so bodhicitta or compassion or kindness, 
for people we like, <laughs> people who treated us well. Let's start there. You know, plucking the low-hanging fruit is good practice when you're developing a skill or a, a trait inside. Start where it's easy and then build from there. Build from there. So if there are people that you just cannot find, you know, bodhicitta for, bodhicitta for, can you find compassion for them? If you cannot find compassion for them, can you find uh, a growing releasing of grievance and vengeance and cruelty and ill will in your own mind? And if you can't do that, can you at least commit to not harming them? This is a progression that adapts from teachings from Larry Yang, who writes about it very eloquently, but there's a progression there. And then we start with what's solid ground and then we expand from there. And it's quite helpful to realize that bodhicitta is, an ind it is independent of moral view. It is independent of skillful action. We can have bodhicitta for our political adversaries. We can find bodhicitta for those who have wronged us deeply. And as I have found, it's in the cultivation of compassion and broadly bodhicitta for those who have wronged me deeply that I become increasingly free of suffering myself and more able to act skillfully, sometimes assertively, uh, with, those, with those people. Bodhicitta does not mean that we let them off the hook. And it does not mean that we sell ourselves out. It's actually a very powerful way to be on our own side, uh, while also gradually being on the side of all beings. The four that I've came, come up with in my extraction of some profound teachings uh, that are deep and rich are first, to cultivate the heart in your own practice. Formal meditations of compassion and kindness, uh, and also hit and run, uh, you know, compassion and kindness in the ordinary flow of your day, including with people, you know, that you're feeling aggravated about. That especially is really a good place to deliberately cultivate some authentic, as you can, genuine compassion and kindness for your own sake, <laughs> you know, as well as for theirs. Cultivation of the heart. Second, uh, as it is meaningful for you, a practice of appreciating another being, another person, including in even radical imagined ways, as if they were, as if they had been your dearest friend or beloved, or perhaps a beloved parent, if you relate to that, in some other time, or in some other way, evoking a sense of really having received a lot of care and help from them. Play with that, imagine that. It's a way to, interestingly, intensify bodhicitta. Third, third, you can explore a sense of personal responsibility for, their, for relieving their suffering. Even a sense of personal responsibility in the ultimate bodhisattva aspiration of, of being responsible somehow for their full awakening as a kind of koan, as a kind of not knowing, a kind of puzzle in which there's still a sincere movement. That's an interesting practice that can be quite radical in like cultivating a, a, a boundless goodwill, good wishes, bodhicitta for them. And then fourth, as the implementation of this, to realize that it is consistent with a sincere bodhisattva a bodhisattva impulse, aspiration, it's consistent with a sincere desire to cultivate bodhicitta to, as Nikosi Johnson put it, to, or to adapt what he said, to be there for their sake, to let go of your own self-interest, at least for a time, reserving your judgment, reserving your rights, certainly, but for at least that moment, to be there entirely for them, Wow, given over to their welfare without reserve. What's that like? As long as it's not exhausting or abusing you in the moment. What's that like? 
And then in that context, being as helpful as you realistically can within the finite limitations of time and energy and occasion and relationship and what you have to offer. That's very legitimate. Very legitimate. The intention and the orientation to them is boundless. But the actual delivery, the enactment, is inherently bounded in various ways. And that's all right. You know? As it is embedded in that larger intention um, of commitment to that other person. <laughs> 